Hello and welcome to CGT in Europe, where we are embarking on a journey back in time across hundreds of millions of years to retrace the steps from the very first life on Earth to the world today. That is quite an ambitious project, isn't it? So, to help us make that voyage, we are going to get some help from a couple of places. Firstly, we have two absolute experts in the field, Professor David Harper from the University of Durham and Professor Jaren Bin of Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology. Great to have you both. So, these two have been collaborating as part of a three-decade-long program between Durham and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So, Professor Harper, let's uh, start with you. So, could you tell us what drew you to the field of paleontology in the first place? Well, the interesting thing was I actually got interested in minerals first. And there was a group of us at school that used to go out um, at the weekends with our chemistry teacher looking for minerals, looking for uh, pyrite, looking for sphalerite, looking for galena. And then I got rather fascinated by the, the rocks that the minerals were in. And they were packed with fossils. They were packed with corals. They were packed with uh, shellfish. And um, they were packed with all these sorts of wonderful ancient creatures. And I began to get very excited about the history of life which is a very long one. So when I went to university, we had a rather inspiring lecture in paleontology, and I decided I wanted to investigate the history of life. That is very interesting. I wish I had such inspiring lessons before when I was a child. So Professor Jem, what is that made you or triggered you to study something that has been dead, I mean, for millions of years? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, pretty similar. I mean, similar reason as Steve has. Um, to make it short, the reason for me to study things that have been dead for millions of years is to tell a wonderful story of life evolution because it is an eternal topic of our mankind. As we all know, those ancient lives witnessed the Earth's history, including the life evolution on Earth. So that's the main reason for, for me. Yeah, great to have you both. And you two are gold mines. Of course, for all of our viewers online, you can follow CGTN Europe over here. As you can see, europe.cgtn.com. You can find us on CGTN app or our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Of course, leave your comments here. And if you have any questions for our professors here, definitely let us know. Of course, as I mentioned, that there are two ways where we can get some help to explore the past. The second one is right in our newsroom, where Lucia Brianza and her friends from CGT and Europe's digital teams will be recreating a timeline of how life evolved. Lucia, great to have you. What do you have over there? So can you explain how you plan to map out the life over the past hundreds of millions of years? Hi, Janhua. So I'm not actually too far from you at the moment. I'm just on the other side of this wall here. So I've actually been to the shops this morning to help me find things to map out our origins of life timeline. And I've gone and bought some very expensive toilet roll. So the brilliant thing about toilet roll is we can map out per each square per million years. Now we've got 200 sheets of toilet roll here. So one square is going to be one million. And if we count seven here, we've actually got the entire history of human evolution. Now, I've not only got the toilet roll here with me, I've brought my colleague James here with me. Say hello, James. Hello. So what he's going to be doing here is going to be drawing us some illustrations to point out the different various points on our timeline. And I can't promise they're going to be the most scientific drawings, but by all means, they'll be brilliant, and I'm sure our experts can help us out there. Anyway, Jan Ho, we'll see you in a few hundred million years. Yeah, that is a very interesting idea for one sheet or one square that is one million years and also you have your friend James who is going to help you with the sketches and the professor hopefully that you have got we ha what we have in the newsroom basically we're going to have something very interesting we're going to unroll the toilet rows for each sheet that is one million years to mark out the timeline over there so professor Harper let's uh, get back to you what were the woes like before life first emerged well, if we go back to the origin of the planet about 4.6 billion years ago, um, 
the, the surface of the Earth would have looked rather miserable. We don't have a lot of evidence for this. There's not many rocks of that age around, virtually none. So a lot of it is um, uh, supposition in a way. Um, the landscapes would have been bare. They would have been um, rather like the landscapes on Iceland, perhaps, to, uh, today, devoid of life, obviously. The skies would have been dark. Um, there would have been um, lavas flowing, magma flowing across the surface of the Earth. Probably no water, um, probably no real atmosphere, and, and obviously, as I mentioned before, a total absence of life. Um, so a rather sterile looking planet with rugged landscapes, but also being cratered by a lot of meteorite impact at the time and some minor volcanic eruptions. And, the, and both professors, I mean, so it's a very interesting theory when it comes to the origins of life. There are so many different theories. And what is yours, Professor Jan? How does life start in the first place? Yeah, um, the life start off, of course, uh, as the pretty, very primitive uh, form. Yeah. Um, we actually have life and its only evolution. Actually, also, we are thinking about the formation of and evolution of Earth ecosystem. And also talking about the controlling and the triggering fa factors of these processes, both biologically and environmentally. So, um, the life, just uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, starts at about 3.8, or somebody say 3.5 billion years ago. That was very primitive and evolved for, um, let's say, about more, a little more than 3 billion years as very primitive forms of life um, all the way in the marine ecosystem. Actually, um, before the Cambrian, we start, we say uh, Cambrian uh, period that starts from 540 million years ago. Before that, the Earth's ecosystem was very primitive in the marine, um, or um, only uh, primitive forms, and such as those single-celled uh, and even not many um, multicellular forms occurred. So before that, and um, we need to find fossil evidences of all these early stages of the uh, evolution of Earth ecosystem. So the first, the and the most important steps, uh, things were for paleontologists is to find those fossil evidences in those uh, very ancient rocks. So you two only they, represent one of the theories. Very uh, interesting, of course. In the meantime, we have got some comments on our Facebook and lots of our viewers are watching. And that is Jimon Lukman from Nigeria. And also we have got Bong Mim, Daniel School, watching from Nigeria too. Good morning to all of you. Of course, if you have any questions, please leave yeah. your comments on our Facebook Live. And then, so we're gonna, we have two wonderful absolute experts in this field. So now, let's say checking on Lucia in the newsroom. So Lucia, I can see a knife over there. Are you literally cutting the toilet for in half? That's exactly what I'm doing, Jan Hua. I'm tearing a toilet roll in half. We've come across 1.5 billion years. We're at 3.5 billion years here. Now, we would ask in our newsroom, quite frankly, it's not that interesting to watch. So from here, we have the first single cell organisms, which wouldn't have been visible to the naked eye. So we're going to move on to 2 million years ago, which would have been the first multi-cell organisms. Now, again, these wouldn't have been visible either. And we've jumped forward 1.5 billion years, except it's not really 1.5 billion, it's 1.48. So here, we're going to tear off 20 sheets of toilet roll. This 
point, we will get to the Cambrian explosion. But I'm not going to bother explaining that to you. I'm going to leave that to our guest expert. So back to you, Jan Hua. Yeah, this is very interesting. I guess that you have seven or six or probably seven and a half toilets rows up there. So Professor Jan, let's get back to our discussion. So how much evidence remains of these early life forms and where could we find it? Yeah, to be honest, not many evidences left Not, not for much us. evidence for, First, for now. Yeah, not many, oh. we, we, we have to say. First, the early life on Earth was pretty poor in richness and diversity and it was very difficult to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Second, for thousands of million years, rocks are metamorphosed, and no fossils could be found in those metamorphosed, particularly deeply metamorphosed rocks. So the rocks of early life on Earth are relatively rare and difficult to be found and to be studied, because they are, and most of them, very tiny. Fortunately, there are some places with these records, such as Australia, North America, and several places in China. So we do have some fossil legislation of early life on Earth. So uh, we are, uh, as a human being, we are, we are pretty lucky. We have those fossil records for us to study those early stages of the origin of life and their early evolution. Yeah, that is very interesting. Only we don't have much evidence, but we have some fossils no. that we can study at this point. And Professor Harper, so we have been going for a few hundred thousand years, and life on Earth is still very much like tiny blobs, I guess. And we have uh, a few more iterations bef to go before we start to get to something more like a plant or animal that we can recognize now. Well, um, yeah, things like plants and animals. Um, uh, we've, we've gone through nearly four-fifths of geological time um, with um, largely microbial organisms, as Ren Bin says. And so we have to come into about the last 600 million years, uh, and that's when we're beginning to see um, a diversity of uh, organisms we, we might actually just start to recognize as at least being animals. Uh, and there is um, a certain group called the Ediacara biota, and these are soft-bodied organisms, and there's a great diversity of different shapes and different sizes. But this is when life uh, began to get large and life began to get complex. And so these soft-bodied organisms, some of them um, look a little bit like arthropods. There's certainly some mollusks there possibly things rather like corals, not quite, um, possible sponges, uh, and certainly algal material. And we're beginning to get little um, calcareous cones um, uh, appearing in the fossil record. We're not quite there yet. We're not in animal or plant-dominated communities. But we're beginning to see um, a group of organisms that were very common around the world. The, there's over uh, 50 different localities where we find the Ediacara biota. Um, there is a key locality in eastern uh, China, the Lantian fauna, uh, which is quite early. And again, it shows um, algal material, it shows organisms with tentacles, all sorts of other things. Ren Bin, I think, will probably have more details on, on that Chinese fauna. Um, but certainly things are beginning to move. As I said before, things are getting larger, things are becoming more complex, and we're getting um, right at the start of animal evolution on the planet. And Professor Jan, Lucia mentions the Cambrian, Cambrian explosion. So can you tell us briefly what happened then and why it was very important? Yeah. So before Cambrian, as I as uh, Dave mentioned, uh, the marine ecosystem, in other words, the Earth's ecosystem, was very monotonous, with only a few tiny forms, some of which are controversial uh, on their biological affinity. That means we don't know all those early forms they are animals or plants or some other things. So we don't know. All of a sudden, various kinds of ball pans occurred 
in marine ecosystem. And uh, almost all known animals in today's marine ecosystem had their earliest known representatives. Just during the uh, transition to Precambrian and Cambrian, that means from uh, 600 million years ago to 540 million years ago. So we call this Cambrian explosion. Yeah, all of a sudden, just actually the, it lasted for uh, tens of many years. But in according to the Earth's history, it still uh, happened in a short time interval. And you can imagine how important such an event is. All of a sudden, all earliest known representatives today we can see in the uh, marine ecosystem just occurred in the uh, marine ecosystem. We have to, so this is very important, and we have to investigate its ins and outs. And that means the causes and effects. Just uh, now Dave mentioned the Cambrian explosion. Somebody, some scientists thought the Cambrian explosion actually lasted for, for, for about 40 million years. Uh, and there, nowadays, there are uh, at least four to five or even more fossil legislators uh, we found everywhere in the world. In China, uh, we also have almost a continuous um, fossil legislators in those early stages like uh, Wengam biota, that was uh, about say, uh, 610 million years ago, and the Lantian biota, it's about 600 million years ago, and biota, it's about 550 million years ago, and all the way to the Chenjiang biota. That's mm -hmm. Um, so all these fossil legislators record, recorded all those um, important fossil evidences. Uh, then uh, we can uh, talk about almost a complete scenario of this major uh, biotic events we call Cambrian explosion. No, thank you very much, Professor Jan. That is some very detailed explanation of the Cambrian explosion. Of course, I have so many questions to ask you. But now, let's come back to our new son, Lucia is there. So, Lucia, what do you have over there? So where you left us was the Cambrian explosion, which was 520 million years ago. We've actually come quite a way, 90 million years, to the conquest of land. Now, this is where we would have seen the amphibians that we probably would recognize today come from the water and onto the land, which is all very exciting. Now, moving on, we're going to go 20 sheets of toilet roll, or 20 million years, to the first arrival of forests. Now, this is where it gets very exciting, because what does forests mean? food and all that biological mass was stuff that then the amphibians and other creatures could then feast on. Now moving on from there, we then have the origins of the first flight. So this is where we'd have had those insects, which probably would have been quite small to start off with, but eventually they reached a point where they had a wingspan of 75 centimeter long wings, basically. So yes, we would have seen creatures like that flying about the, the sky and almost the length of my arm. What do you think of that, Janhua? Yeah, that is uh, lovely. I mean, we were just uh, talking for about like 20 minutes or 15 minutes, and then you have gone like 90 million years already and the uh, advent of forest and also some giant dragonflies. That sounds very terrifying, isn't it? So, Professor Harper, I guess all of these new life forms are starting to have an impact on the planet. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the, these guys were quite scary. Um, we, we've got to just uh, remember, going on from the Cambrian explosion, um, animals acquired skeletons, um, life diversified in the oceans, all sorts of incredible um, animals, including the fishes, were um, evolving um, on the land, um, as Lucia says, 
um, things like ichthyostasia, giant amphibians were crawling on uh, during the Devonian. And then we come into the age of the forests during the Carboniferous. Um, and um, in these forests, there were these incredible um, insects, the giant uh, dragonflies. On the ground, there were huge millipedes. Uh, Arthropleura was um, almost three meters long. Um, absolutely <laughs> terrifying on the ground. Um, but I, I, I think the, the, the really spectacular thing is the development, evolution of the forest um, and, and trees with root systems into the ground, uh, um, growing to considerable heights, developing canopies um, above the earth, and obviously now beginning to pump a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere uh, and building up the oxygen levels. And so uh, a huge impact on the ecosystems uh, providing vegetation for the herbivores, um, but also uh, providing a much more oxygenated atmosphere, which will help um, uh, the metabolism of, of organisms, um, but, but, but also the, the, the actual growth of them uh, developing into a much larger size. So a huge impact on the planet, uh, a very big jump forward uh, with uh, the forests, the vegetation, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Yeah, Professor Harper, before we move on to Professor Jan, so we were talking about the giants, dragonflies. I'm very curious about those, I mean, animals, let's call them that. Were they carnivorous or herbivorous in the past? Well, I, I think they would have, they would have been um, sort of lo looking at the, uh, um, the, the skies, and, and looking at a lot of um, much smaller insects um, that, that had already evolved um, around there. Uh, and, and so they would be catching um, insects um, on the wing, essentially, as, the, as they buzz through the, the trees. And now they're getting much smaller because the oxygen level is getting lower compared with before, like 35 million years ago. So Professor Jan, we talk about these forests geographically where were we located and would they resemble something that we might see on the planet today? Yeah, uh, actually there are many localities, mm -hmm. many in the world with such geological forests recorded. Uh, uh, for example, almost all continents nowadays we can find such a kind of geological forests. So actually we are talking about the terrestrial ecosystem. Now, Earth's ecosystem, we have different, we have two kinds. Now, the life on Earth started from, from marine, yeah, uh, originated in marine, and at first, firstly, we have the green ecosystem, and starting about uh, 450 million years ago, uh, probably, and we have uh, the terrestrial ecosystem. And gradually, actually uh, rapidly, in the just now Dave mentioned, in the Devonian period, we have forest, uh, very big trees, uh, tens of meters high, and uh, a lot of other kinds of animals, plants, uh, uh, flourishing on land. Now this kind of, uh, to the, to the, all the way, to the Mesozoic, uh, that's uh, about 250 million years to um, a little more than 100 million years ago, the, that we call the Mesozoic. The um, terrestrial forest, even um, more diverse. Yeah, in China, we have a very famous fossil legislator. That's terrestrial fossil legislator in northeastern China, we have found a wonderful uh, biota. We call it Jeho biota. Very abundant, exceptionally preserved, where uh, um, fossil legislation were found, you know, various kinds of land, animals, plants, yeah, and those animals including vertebrates and invertebrates. So, um, such geological forests I, I'm talking about, 
So we can find many places in the world. And it, similarly, uh, it's this kind of forest, very similar to those tropic forests we can find nowadays on Earth, um, many places in the world. Yeah, it seems like we used to have more forests and probably the diversity was much stronger than it is now at this point. Now, let's uh, checking on Lucia at this point. Hi, Lucia, yeah, great to there. see okay. you again. So I can see this cup yeah. of water. What's that for, Lucia? Are we standing by, happy? Okay, stand by. Okay. Stand by. Stand by. Wow. That's right. That's right, we have reached the dinosaur period. We've reached the dawn of the dinosaurs. So this was 200 million years ago. We've come 150 million years from our original point over there. So yeah, we would have seen some very exciting creatures planting around the place, maybe some Tyrannosaurus rexes and Velociraptors. But we're actually going to move on now, 60 million years, where we see the first flowering plants. Now, James has drawn us a lovely illustration here. We can see a beautiful flower. And so this means we've got some more vegetation for plants. We can see more things start to pollinate and where the earth became a little bit more beautiful. Now, I think this is quite a late period for flowers to come. What can you tell us more, Jan Hua? <laughs> that is very interesting. You are in the newsroom right now. So basically, professors, at this point, it's very interesting because that is uh, 200 million years ago. I think that is the most exciting part of this uh, Facebook Live, at least for me. I mean, the, uh, we see dinosaurs. So before we move on to something um, more serious, more scientific. So Professor Harper, which type of dinosaur <laughs> is your favorite? Um, well. There's about 700 different species of dinosaur that have been described. I think over 150 have been described from, uh, from Britain. Um, a huge variety of dinosaurs, the, the huge um, herbivorous um, uh, animals such as uh, Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, uh, Diplodocus, um, fantastic animals, uh, absolutely enormous. I think that was the, um, the thumping a thud of their, their feet that was shaking the water there. Um, the, 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 the pretty, um, uh, yeah, they, these are the guys there, um, very long necks and, um, and, and grazing on the upper canopies of the forests at that particular time. Um, Predators, Tyrannosaurus, that captures everybody's imagination uh, as, as being a, a pretty ferocious um, carnivore and predator. Um, so um, the, there's a huge diversity that's very, very difficult to, to choose. Um, but Lucia mentioned um, the flowering plants and mentioned colour. But I think colour uh, probably had arrived already on the planet uh, because we know that many um, uh, or some groups of dinosaurs were, were feathered for insulation purposes initially, uh, and um, they, their, their feathers were coloured. And some of the key evidence, again, comes from China. And one of my favourite um, dinosaurs, um, which is just on the, on the verge of uh, becoming a bird, it's a feathered dinosaur, and this is Sinosauropteryx. Um, and um, it's very similar, I guess, to Archaeopteryx, uh, which is the one known from the Solnhofen limestone in Germany. Uh, but these guys, they're essentially dinosaurs. They've developed wings, they've developed feathers, and they develop color in their feathers. And they must have been absolutely fantastic um, animals to, to see on the planet. So my choice is not any of the huge spectacular guys, the herbivores, the carnivores, the uh, enormous um, uh, dinosaurs that weighed so many tons, but I go for these little um, feathered dinosaurs um, that are eventually going to evolve into the birds that we see today. How about you, Professor Jan? Yeah, um, Big dinosaurs, guys, small cars. ones. No, everybody likes it. So I'm, I'm not a, a dinosaur expert, but here um, I have two points mm -hmm. um, uh, I would like to share with the audience. First, dinosaur with various kinds 
uh, its, its many kinds and dominated the Earth's terrestrial ecosystem for more than 150 million years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's the first point I, I want to share with the audience. Second, the Mesozoic era, we say it, it's a kind of time, it, uh, time interval from 250 million years ago to 66 million years ago. So was the era of reptiles when the marine was dominated by ichthyosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and the land, including the big rivers and lakes, was dominated by dinosaur, and the sky also uh, was dominated, not dinosaur, dinosaur just on land in marine by ichthyosaurs and the land by dinosaur and the sky by pterosaur. So three different kind of reptiles dominated the terrestrial ecosystem for more than, uh, more than 150 uh, million years or even close to 200 million years. So that's the uh, two points I want to share with the audience. Mm -hmm. So Professor Harper, a fun fact about dinosaurs. Were dinosaurs really like the, the ones that we see in films? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting point. I would say that um, quite a number of the films have very um, serious scientific experts that work on them. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly Walking with Dinosaurs, which was a television series fairly recently, um, had a number of uh, key specialists that advise the um, advise the film directors on on the the mode of life, how how they um, how they acted, and and so I'd have quite a bit of confidence in some of the more recent series um, on on dinosaurs. And how about you, Professor John? I mean, some of the dinosaurs that we see usually in films are feathered. Some of them are featherless. I mean, it is very hard for us now to reconstruct what dinosaurs were like before? Uh, the uh, still reconstruct the actually we still need to study the terrestrial ecosystem, the mm -hmm. entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So we are interested in dinosaurs, but we have to pay attention to all those uh, living uh, organisms uh, during the Mesozoic, uh -huh. I mean living together with dinosaurs not only pay attention to the dinosaurs, but also we have to pay attention to all the other uh, animal or uh, plants. So uh, that's the um, ecosystem we, we have to pay attention to. So Professor Harper, very interesting question for you. I mean, in the film Jurassic World, so in it, the dinosaurs were, you know, brought back to life, to the world of today. Is it possible? I mean, can we get to the genes? and rebuilt the dinosaurs? Well, well there's a, uh, um, I, technology is moving forward rather rapidly. Um, if we can get material trapped in amber, for example, there are all sorts of possibilities. Um, but there's also a very big ethical uh, question there. Should we actually do that? Um, and, and that um, applies to things such as mammoths, in which mm -hmm. we're getting very close to mm -hmm. being able to, to, to do these sorts of exercises um, with extinct organisms that are much closer to home. And so it's a very big ethical field. Um, we're losing a lot of diversity on the planet at the moment. Organisms are becoming extinct mm -hmm. at, at high rates, but, but should we, um, should we be um, uh, bringing them back to life? Uh, and should we be going even deeper in time, back hundreds of millions of years, to our favorite, um, our favorite animals or plants and seeing if we can resuscitate them? Um, I think there are all sorts of possibilities in the future, certainly, the rate of technology at the moment. Uh, but I think the bigger question is, should we actually be doing it? Yeah, that's right. And should we be doing it? Or 
And a very interesting question for you, Professor Jan. We all know we are quite familiar with the demise of dinosaurs. So what could be the reasons behind that? It was a climate change award. Oh, yes. Um, all the, just now uh, we were talking about the ecosystem. So all the... Um, organisms evolved in the geological history and also actually affected by the environmental changes. It's all the way from the starting point to, to now. So we notice we, we are paying attention to the habitable, uh, I mean, the Oath uh, system. So we have to uh, pay attention to the environmental change when we talking about the uh, change of ecosystem. Thank you very much, professors. And now let's start checking on Lucia. Lucia, how is it going there in the newsroom? So you left us at flowering plants. Now we've moved on into the heart of the newsroom. We've arrived at the desk. So shortly round here, we have now seen the arrival of mammals and some of the things that the experts were talking about earlier. So the mammoths and other creatures that now would be the big predators of dinosaurs and now seeing the arrival of these big mammals. We've just got now one stop to go. So we're back to you now, Zhanghua. Mammals and mammoths. I mean, I see, just see a lot of those mammoths. Very interesting. So let's get back to our professors in the studio. So Professor Harper, the arrival of human beings, how much of a big deal that is in the story of life? I mean, we have been, have been hearing a lot about Homo sapiens or Neanderthals. Can you elaborate on those? Yeah, indeed. I, I just, I, I'd like to roll back a little bit mm -hmm. um, because we, we, we glossed over the meteorite strike at the end of the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. And I think for many of us in the science, um, the, this meteorite strike and all the implications of that in uh, removing the dinosaurs and many um, other um, animals and plants at the time made way for the, the mammals to actually expand and take over many of the ecological niches and move forward and evolve um, towards ourselves. Um, the, the implications of humans on the planet are absolutely enormous. Um, certainly ourselves, um, we have uh, a certain consciousness um, we are able to explore our past and understand our past. And um, we're also probably able now to think of the future, uh, which other organisms probably can't do, and, and predict our future and, and try and um, um, govern our future to a certain extent. Um, so when humans arrive on the planet, and you mentioned in the Neanderthals, and I think they probably have a much more sophisticated culture uh, than we previously thought. Um, and then the evolution um, through um, the various uh, Australopithecines and Homo erectus, Homo habilis, though, those sorts of organisms onto ourselves. Um, humans started making tools. They started organizing themselves um, and they started um, agricultural uh, sort of processes. Um, they, 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 they moved on um, to um, urbanization, that they actually uh, grouped themselves together into bigger and bigger communities. Um, we, we know that they've, um, uh, more recently, we've participated in various industrial revolutions. Uh, we've mined coal, we've mined minerals. We've made steel. Um, we, we're moving now into areas of high technology. Uh, and so all of these things have consequences uh, for the planet. We, we consume a lot. We make a lot. Um, we, um, we waste a lot. And uh, we've developed all sorts of sources of energy um, through the um, hydrocarbons, um, oil and gas, um, th those sorts of things. And these have created a huge human footprint on the planet. We can almost say that humans are, are actually influencing all sorts of processes, even geological processes, on our planet today. And so 
carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is at very high levels. It's um, over 400 parts per million. And uh, the planet is heating. And it's going to be very difficult to keep it to um, an increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade. So, yes, we've had a huge impact on our on our planet. A lot of it has been extremely good, but a lot of it has been very bad. Yes. And Professor Jam, the arrival of human yeah. beings, the sim quite similar question for you. How come that human beings are so different from other animals? I'm pretty sure that you too believe the theory of evolution. And how come that some of the chimpanzees, I mean, which are believed to be the origins of human beings or homo sapiens in the first place, they're left behind? Yeah, um, actually, to be Dave behind? just now already gave, uh, gave us a, a very complete explanation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to make um, a couple of points. First of all, I want to um, emphasize the origin of human being, particularly uh, the Homo sapiens, just now you mentioned. Mm -hmm. the, it's actually uh, absolutely an accidental event during the long history of life evolution uh, on Earth. So it's accidental. Uh, the second point I want to make is a uh, human being, nowadays we are using um, all uh, kinds of, of various kinds of natural resources we can use, but actually um, we, 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 we nobody uh, should think uh, we are uh, controlling the, the natural world, controlling the world, and we have the power to controlling everything. No, it's a, it's a wrong way. So we have to be um, uh, living harmoniously together with all living organisms, including the natural. Uh, I mean, including uh, every living things uh, on Earth. So um, it's accidental for human being, for the origin of human being. It's still mysterious, and many things we still don't know. Um, that's uh, what I want to say. Yeah, that is true. It is still quite mysterious, and still we don't know yeah. how calm that human beings came into being in the, first, in the first place. So we know the demise of dinosaurs, it could be because of climate change, or as Professor Harper said, it could be because of the meteorite strike. So how about human beings? We have been talking about climate change for all the past few years. Do you think that human beings, I mean the demise of human beings could happen if we don't rein in climate change, Professor Harper? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think this is a, a, a really active question at the moment, and I think it is. Um, it, it, uh, the, the world is on the edge of a tipping point. Um, we may have passed that tipping point, um, but throughout um, uh, the um, uh, geological history on this planet, and the the one key area that we work on is um, we, we work with fossils and they are the key piece of evidence for evol evolution of life on the planet. Um, but if uh, we, we roll this forward and most of the big extinction events are due to habitat loss and extinctions, um, we, we see the migration of organisms as the planet uh, heats up or the planet cools down or uh, whatever um, is happening. Um, so we see these migrations and eventually when there's nowhere to go, when all the habitats are destroyed, they become extinct if they can't adapt. So um, today, um, habitats are being destroyed, sea levels are, are, are rising, we're seeing droughts, we're, we're, we're seeing um, an increase in hurricane activity, we're seeing wildfires, uh, we're seeing all these sorts of um, phenomena happening due to the, the global heating. Um, and, and, and so habitats are being destroyed and we will see mass migration. We will see um, more um, refugees mo moving from areas where their habitats have been destroyed. Uh, and um, the, the possibility is there of the uh, eventual um, 
extinction. But it needn't happen. It can be reversed, and we can take a lot more care of our planet uh, and avoid this, um, this happening. Thank you very much, Professor. That is uh, Professor David Harper from the University of Durham and Professor Jen Renbin of Nanjing Institute of Geology and Paleontology. Great to have you both on our show today. Thank you so much. Good stuff. And now yeah, let's start you. checking on Lucia in the, uh, in the newsroom. So we've now come to the very end of our timeline. This is the arrival of the Homo sapiens. So from the beginning, we tore off those seven sheets, which brings us right up until today. Now, if we were to continue, we'd probably see way into the future development of AI will continue development of AI. Maybe robots will be ruling the universe, but we're not here to look into the future. We're here to go back. So let's retrace our Go. We have the first arrival of the Homo sapiens. A little further back, well, a long further back, we see the first arrival of mammals. So this was the mammoths that we were talking about before. Then we go even further, and we see where the planet started to become more beautiful with flowering plants and other things that were able to pollinate. Where the dinosaurs, so this is... So some creatures there and arrived for us to see. Then we go further back. Again, these dragons. Oh, apparently, the signal is not that good in the newsroom because we These have been talking have about like ancient times. Maybe there was no signal I mean, in the past in primitive times. At all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Lucia. So, yet, what a journey indeed, and all that remains for me to do is to thank our guests who have had the patience to stick with us from the very beginning. It's been wonderful to have their expertise from the two opposite sides of the globe. And please do follow CGT in Europe on Facebook, TikTok, or Telegram to learn more. I promise it's not just toilet rolls timelines.